Brain Zone. How are you? Good getting into that. There's one right here. Well, I don't know if he's been good. Adorable, yes, and very loving, but don't know about the good. Anyway, um, this is one of two videos I'm recording today. I just wanted to briefly say hi. I could bring this closer to me. There we go. Um, so, um, I'm back in the U.S., obviously. Um, Zen's right here. And a couple of people were kind of confused as to what I was doing in Norway and all of that business, so I thought I would explain. So... I went to Norway under a specific... So, let me back up. Norway does not allow people from outside of certain countries into Norway right now. Uh, those countries that are allowed in are basically the EU, plus some other European countries, and a couple of other random countries throughout the world. Uh, like the United Arab Emirates and Kuwait, I think is the other one. Anyway, um, there's a limited number of countries whose populations are allowed entrance into Norway. And everybody else, the answer is no, basically. Um, there are some exceptions, though, and one of those exceptions is if you have a romantic partner who is a permanent resident of Norway, or citizen. Let me put back my little remote. Um, and I have that. My romantic partner is, in fact, a Norwegian citizen. Ow. So when that became allowed again, because during the early to mid part of the pandemic it was allowed, but not up until uh, I think no Octo beginning of October was the first time that was allowed. So that was the point where uh, Kriotir and I started making all the plans for me to come visit. I was there for a little over three weeks, and... As I have mentioned in a previous video, I was required to enter quarantine in order to go over there. Um, quarantine sucks. I don't recommend it for anybody who has issues with being by themselves for three to four days in a room where you're not allowed to leave the room and you're fed whatever the hell they give you. Um, that's no slight against the quarantine hotel. They did a reasonable job. And in theory now, I would actually be able to quarantine at my partner's home. But in practice, that's also not very viable because my partner lives in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, um, the reason why I went wasn't to get married. The reason why I went is that I wanted to see my partner again. That's it. That's the full reason why I decided to go because I had not been in person with them in almost a year and a half. And that is the longest period of time that we have not seen each other since we've been together. That's a lot. Um, the last time Kriotir and I had seen each other would have been the end of June 2020, or beginning of June 2020. Um, that's when we finally got them on a flight back home because they got stuck in the U.S. due to the quarantine, or due to the pandemic. And so that means that it had been a year and four and a half months since we had seen each other. And the longest stretch that we had gone prior to then would have been a little under a year. So that sucked. I wanted to be able to see my partner. Now, um, when I mentioned that, um, a lot of you know that my, hold on, uh, my plan is to get married and permanently move over there. So a lot of people were asking me, well, why didn't you get married when you were over there? So... The people asking me this for reference are all American, so I get to explain this because it's weird and the U.S. doesn't do this at all. In order to get married in Norway, regardless of whether you're a Norwegian citizen, American citizen, citizen of any country, in order to get married to a Norwegian citizen in Norway, you must prove that you are eligible to be married. In Norway, what you do is that you submit paperwork to the Norwegian tax office that says, hey, look, I'm about to get married, and the tax office goes, sweet, cool. Um, that is the equivalent in the U.S. of applying for a marriage certificate, which, fun fact, in the U.S., the moment you have a signed marriage certificate, you're married. In Norway, that's not the case. They instead have to get a permission to be married, basically, um, or... And the tax office, what they give you is an eligibility form, basically, of, yes, you are eligible to get married because you're not currently married. 
The reason why it's the tax office for reference is the same reason why a lot of people get married in the U.S. for tax benefits. That's the only mechanical reason to get married is you get benefits on your taxes. So that's the only governmental interference with it. I'm an American citizen. In the U.S., if you want to get married, you go get married. They actually don't check much of anything. That's actually how you end up hearing of these stories about having a person with two families in different cities type of thing. It's because they don't actually check to see if you're eligible to be married. So I have to go through a process uh, that basically I check in with the state and go, hey, look, state of Wisconsin, yeah, can you write up a form that says that there is no evidence that I am married or have ever been married? And, or alternately, that I've been married and divorced. Both work, but I've never been married. Um, can you do all of that? And then can... Okay, got that. That part's done for reference for me. The problem is that I needed to get it notarized and then apostolized. So notaries, for those of you outside the United States that may not know, and or some Americans that have never had to encounter this, is basically a governmental form that proves that it is legit. So you get something notarized, or not necessarily governmental, but you get something notarized that says, yes, I have signed this, and here is the proof. I actually had a witness whose job it is to witness such things and stamp it and say, yes, I have witnessed this person doing it. So I needed to have a notarized certificate from the state of Wisconsin. And then it has to be apostolized. Apostolizing is something that was completely new to me and new to everyone that I've talked to. Uh, apparently, this is actually a part of the same international agreement as the Geneva Convention. Ha! <laughs> that is basically an international version of a notary. This says that, yes, this is an official document and is to be presented internationally. In the United States, the way you get apostolized documents is by submitting them to the United States State Department unless if it's a state document. State documents can be notarized by the Secretary of State of your respective state, which for those outside the U.S. that makes zero sense, but it's basically a federalization of powers situation where federal government stuff can do federal government things, state government stuff can do state government things, which means that if it's entirely inside of the state, the proper representative on the international stage is the state level, not the national level. So Wisconsin had this, I finally found it, it took me way too long, this situation where you basically get the records signed, notarized, but they're actually the ones that send it to the, US, the Wisconsin Secretary of State to get apostolized and then send it out. So in theory, that should all be finished at this point. But it took me so long to find that information because if you look on Google for this type of thing, you only find about the U.S. State Department part which I'll get to why that's not a good idea in a moment. But that meant that the absolute earliest possible it could have arrived in Norway would have been the, my last day there. Or my last day in um, where my partner lives. Because I have it being mailed directly to my partner, since they're the ones that need the information. The way you're supposed to do this is through the U.S. State Department. However, on their website, they basically say, yeah, this is totally doable, just... Schedule an appointment, it takes 50 minutes total. They would do all of the work, they would do the research, they would sign the paperwork, they would authorize it and basically hand it to you. Two problems with this. One, the um, embassy is located in Oslo, Norway, which is on the western, or eastern part of, no, yeah, eastern part of Norway, and I was in western Norway the entire time. So that would have been pretty far out of my way. Possible, mind you, it's not... Norway's a large country, but I could have arranged my vacation to go to Oslo. But a pain. But the bigger problem is the fact that they had no openings for their appointments. Not that they were full. They literally have zero appointments available for the next year because they decided to stop all non-essential services in the embassy due to COVID-19. They decided that this counts as a non-essential service, so there is no way of doing it. Literally, the only way that anyone tells you on how to get the Apostle stamp for a proof that you can be married is impossible. This is why it took me so long to find the other route with the state. And there's actually a chance that I might need to also do this for the state of Florida. 
I'm not sure how far back they need the evidence for. It could be that they need the evidence. Um, one bit of document, random bit online that I found says that it, they need evidence going back from when you were 16 years old. And I haven't been living in the state of Wisconsin that entire time. That's potentially three states that I need to get this information for. Uh, it's a royal pain, but I'm pretty sure just the Wisconsin one's fine because I've been in Wisconsin for 13 years. Um, so after all of that, that means I'm eligible to get married. My partner has to start the process at that point, submitting my paperwork along with theirs to get their eligibility to get married, which means that there's a two to four week lag time from what the Norwegian government officials were saying. Now, that's with an asterisk, because each time that we've gone through this type of thing with the Norwegian government, they'll give a lag time of X amount of weeks and it ends up much shorter than that. Which is the reason why, in theory, if all of the stars aligned together, I could have actually gotten married on this trip, but it was very unlikely, so I didn't really take it into account. So that means that I am going to have to go back to Norway, probably at about January-ish is my guess, to get married. Well, sort of. So the next steps past this, after that documentation comes back, is that we need to get married. Um, uh, we're not doing a fancy ceremony or anything like that. It's just a simple signing of documents and that's it. Because, well, let's be honest, neither one of us are really big believers in marriage. Um, but we have that quarantine problem again. So if I were to return to Norway, well, right now I'd be fine-ish. But if I were to return to Norway more than 10 days after that I have left Norway... So, in other words, if I were to return to Norway on Thanksgiving or something like that, I would have to go through quarantine again. I do not want to go through quarantine again. At all. That that was pretty horrible. It was really bad for me brain-wise because I'm really bad at handling being by myself without any contact with anyone whatsoever. I mean, even a kitty would help. Actually, a cat would have helped quite a bit in quarantine hotel. But there are other options, though. Because Norway is really the only European country that has that weird quarantine rule where they don't trust American proof of vaccination unless if you happen to be Norwegian. So I can actually go to other countries and not have to go through quarantine. Kanatir can also go to other countries without having to go through quarantine because they're also fully vaccinated and have records for it and so on. And Norwegian proof of vaccination is accepted throughout the EU along with other similarly aligned areas, basically the Schengen area. Uh, which means that if I were to get married, chances are I would just not get married in the country of Norway. I would get married in, say, Denmark, which is my tentative plan in the event that quarantine's still up. So at that point, I can get married in Denmark, which is a valid ceremony. They have the same requirements for Norwegian citizens as Norway does. So that's not... I already have to go through all the rest of the paperwork either way, so that's not a problem. Um, in Denmark, you can get married with five days notice, so that's not going to be a problem. We can arrange it, get married, and I fly back. Once I arrive back in the U.S., I can start the Norwegian paperwork for permanent residency. One of you are probably asking yourselves, why didn't we just do it the other way around, where uh, Kreatir would come to the U.S. and we would get married? Because then we'd be doing under U.S. laws rather than Norwegian laws, where U.S. laws are much more liberal about getting married. Again, they don't really check anything. And there's a really simple answer for that. You cannot enter the United States under a tourist visa to get married. You can for most countries. The U.S. is an exception. You have to be under a specific type of visa in order to enter the United States to get married. That visa has a two to three year lead time. And that was before the pandemic. Uh, I have not actually looked online to see if they've updated it, because I don't particularly want to go that route anyway. But, that's a lot. And, it's considered a visa violation if you use a tourist visa to enter the United States to get married, so I'm not going to. Uh, in theory, we could have actually pulled it off during the pandemic, because there's a limit of time where basically, like, if you've been in the U.S. for two months... 
they no longer care about the fact that it was a tourist visa versus any other type of visa. You can go get married at that point. Because the idea being that you didn't come to the country specifically to get married. You came to the country for other reasons, fell in love, and decided to get married at that point. Um, Pietier was here for four and a half months. That's definitely longer than two months. It wouldn't have been a problem. Of course, trying to find a justice of peace to marry you in a, in a pandemic is a bit difficult. But anyway, um, so that's actually the next steps of, okay, I need to get married. Or the paperwork needs to be filled out on Kriyatur's side. Then, once that goes through, we can get married, which is going to require a trip to Scandinavia-ish area, whether it's just me traveling to Norway because I can get in without having to go through that horrible, onerous quarantine, or if it is uh, Kriyatur and I both going to a place somewhere in between to get married. After we get married, I come back here, to start the paperwork process for gaining permanent residency to Norway. That paperwork process currently takes three months. So if I get married in January, that means that that paperwork will be finished in April. And I am looking to move April, May, June-ish. Uh, that's the goal. Really, I think I'm fine as long as I move before November. So my goal is to leave the United States permanently within a year. Or at about a year. And... In case if you're wondering, the reason why I chose November is the election. Um, I don't necessarily want to be here if bad things happen. Then there's the last thing. Um, after that, after we are married, after that I filled out all the paperwork, I need to decide where I'm living. So the plan is that I'm not going to move to where Creator lives because they live in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's a lot better for me now. Like, this past trip, I was there for eight days. Every other trip, I had only been there for three days before I started getting very antsy and very nervous about everything. The reason being is that they're in the middle of nowhere. I don't speak Norwegian. And if you live in the middle of nowhere, you're far less likely to encounter people who speak English fluently. Um, now, there are people who speak English fluently around, but there are so few people around in general that... Long story short, if something were to happen, that would be bad. Also, Kriyatir's place is probably not big enough for me and them. Never mind me and them and six cats. So, yeah, I am going to be moving to a city. And there are two cities on my list that I'm planning on moving to. And I visited both of them during this trip with the idea of me looking around, trying to figure out if I can live there. Uh, those cities, for reference, are Bergen and Stavanger. There are... So, brief geography lesson. Uh, in Norway, the largest city is Oslo. The second largest city is Bergen, and the third largest city is Stavanger, asterisk. Um, the actual third largest city depends on whether you're talking about city area or metric... Or, not metric, um, metro area. Because Stavanger itself is smaller than Trondheim, but the metro area of Stavanger is significantly larger than Trondheim, and Trondheim's metro area. So to give a frame of reference for those of you who are Wisconsinites, um, Oslo is about the population of Milwaukee, uh, Bergen's about the population of Madison, and Stavanger is about the population of Green Bay. So the first, second, and third largest cities. Ow. His claws are still really sharp. Um, the first, second, and third largest cities in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, actually, Wisconsin is a good analog for Norway in terms of population. Not so much in terms of geography. <laughs> but, so we're talking, Oslo is too large for me. Uh, my preference when it comes to living in places is basically Madison's toward the upper side of my population limit. In theory. In practice, I can easily go for larger because Madison is so... It's the largest small town I've ever lived in, basically. So it feels a lot more like a small town to me rather than a big city. So it doesn't really bother me to live in a city of Madison, especially since I don't live downtown. But in general, Oslo is off the table for me, unless if I were to get a job in Oslo. At that point, yeah, sure. It's not like I'm going to say no to moving there. It's just I don't particularly want to. Not to mention it's really far away from where Creator lives. So that leaves the other cities. And I had been looking initially at um, Bergen, Osund, and Stavanger. 
I mean, ideally, if I spoke fluent Norwegian, I would probably not even look at those, and I would move to Føde, which is a mountain valley coastal city in western Norway that's relatively small. It's about ten to 15,000 people, I want to say. I don't know. You can look on Wikipedia. Maybe editor me. Maybe I'll bother editing this. Um... But the problem is that it's still kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's still a reasonably long trip to get to the nearest city to, in order to get onto an airport to leave the country. Um, there is an airport for Fuda. I should mention that. But still, it's not the greatest for somebody who doesn't speak Norwegian. Never mind that there's very little. So the reason... Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. Um, so I marked that off a while ago. And Alsund is a university town. That seemed like, okay, there's going to be a reasonably high population of people who speak English, but it's significantly further north. The further north you go, the worse seasonal affective disorder is going to be. And one of the big questions that we have is whether or not I'm going to be heavily affected by it. I don't know. The longest night cycle that I've had as an adult is living here in Madison, and that is nothing compared to most of Norway. Norway is significantly further north than the United States, outside of Alaska. What, um, Oslo, I think, is roughly in line with Anchorage, Alaska? Latitude-wise? So yeah, um, they have significantly less light. And once you, like, Alsund is as far north as I was even considering. I wasn't even, and Trondheim I could have done if I had a job there, but if I don't have a job there, I have no reason to want to go there. And that was the absolute furthest north that I was even close to willing to consider. Alsund has nice weather for being that far north. It's basically on an island sticking out in the North Atlantic, which means that it's relatively temperate. But it's really far north, and winter is going to be filled with night. And that might not be the greatest of ideas for me to immediately jump that far north. Plus, I couldn't find a board gaming slash role playing slash card gaming store. And one of my goals is to have a place that I can socialize, which means a group of people who are willing to speak English, at least in context of a game, which is why I'm thinking board games and card games and role playing games, because the manuals are in English. Um, two, nearby a bakery. Three, access to an airport. Four, being able to visit Creator and vice versa. Um, that last part is not really that big of a deal as long as I'm still in Norway and in a relatively populated area. So that part I'm not too concerned about. But the rest of it, um, Alston does not appear to have any type of board gaming place where they have tables off to the side type of thing so you can go play. Um, so I struck that off. And that left Bergen and um, Stavanger. Bergen I've been to many times, so I didn't really need to look too much at the city, which is good, because outside of quarantine, I was there for three days. Um, I was mostly looking at terms of housing and how would I travel back and forth and so on. And the answer for Bergen is I would be heavily relying on public transit. Bergen is less walkable than Stavanger. It's significantly better than Madison. It's significantly better than most U.S. cities, for that matter. It's probably on the level of Chicago. So that's still reasonably good, but you have relatively long distances away between inexpensive-ish housing and city center, or city centrum. Which is a problem, because I want to live in a more, more urbanized area? Uh, that's not quite right. I want to live where the people are. I want to be able to walk to things. That doesn't mean I'm not going to use public transit, just I want to be able to walk. And Bergen is less good at that than Stavanger. When I was in Stavanger, I was in a neighborhood of Stavanger called Paradise. I loved it there. It was great for walking. It took me 10 minutes to walk from Paradise to the city center. In 10 minutes around here, I can walk to a post office. Actually, that might be more than 10 minutes even. So that's way better than I am doing right now. It is so much better. And there's a large amount of transit going on. And 
I found two board gaming stores, board gaming slash card gaming slash role playing game stores, all within easy walks, even to each other. Um, one's the ch main chain for Norway. The other one is actually an independent, like standard board gaming shop. Also, Stavanger has a huge advantage in the fact that it has a very large English speaking population. Um, not that most Norwegians don't speak English, they do, but I'm referring to social English. So what I'm, I've mentioned this before in a video, but, um, Norwegians will understand English. That's not a problem. But when they're socializing, they're going to be speaking Norwegian. That makes perfect sense. Stavanger has a large immigrant population, primarily due to the oil fields, because it's the oil capital of Norway, and along with having a lot of international offices for various organizations that are international organizations, which means they have a large population who don't speak Norwegian natively. This, in my mind, is my key to being able to adjust. I am not planning on doing that forever. My plan is to basically, okay, I am basically giving my brain a huge shock in the difference between here and moving to Norway. What are some things that I can alleviate some of the shock and draw it out? Language. I've been trying to learn Norwegian. Um, Kinnichir and I were actually practicing on various foods. That's actually one of the areas that I'm fairly good at. But I'm not going to be fluent by the time I move. There's no way. Even if I did not get a job, dropped everything, and started learning right now, 40 hours a week, I don't think I would be fluent. I don't even know if I'd become... And as it is today, I'm not expecting to be comfortable enough to carry on a more than a very simple conversation. Basically, I'm expecting my Norwegian skill to be probably on par with my Spanish skill at peak Spanish knowledge, which is I can engage in a simple conversation, I can deal with transactions in Spanish, I can count, I can do some basic things, I can say hi, I can understand what people are saying, sort of, and that's about it. That's kind of where I'm expecting my Norwegian to be, because what I need is immersion. So the plan is that I move to Norway, and that's when I start picking up fluency, rather than just picking up phrasing, picking up Oh, I can do grocery shopping in Norwegian without having to use Google Translate. Stuff like that. So, that's where I'm currently stuck at, is whether I move to Bergen or Stavanger. So, I've talked a lot about the advantages of Stavanger in the video so far. Namely, it's more welcoming to somebody like me. It has a better social scene for not just somebody like me who only speaks English, but also somebody like me in general. They have a significantly larger board gaming and role-playing presence from what I've seen. It's a smaller city, which is generally good for me. It's about 100,000 people. Um, the city, city center itself is actually more expensive than Bergen, but it's a lot more spread out. So I can have a living state like what I currently have here, where I'm in suburbs-ish. But more importantly, where I'm not in extremely crowded and noisy areas without having to spend a huge amount of money. Um, Bergen, it's going to be overall slightly cheaper, but the slightly part is not by a whole bunch. Um, Bergen is also much closer to where Creator lives. That's actually the main advantage to Bergen. Um, Bergen is about two and a half hours away, travel-wise, from where Creator lives. Stavanger, you have to get to Bergen before you can leave for Stavanger. And Stavanger is about five hours away from Bergen. So that's the difference between, like, for instance, I live in Madison. A trip to Chicago would be the two and a half to three hour mark. A trip to Minneapolis is more like the other one, where that's an all-day affair. You're not doing anything else that day. Whereas a trip to Chicago, you could take the trip to Chicago, do stuff, and then come back in the same day. That is viable. So... That's basically where I'm at. Bergen at least does have a board gaming store. One. Um, they, that with tables and so on. I mean, there's board gaming shops in other of these cities too, but they're tiny things and primarily bookstores, that type of thing. Um, Stavanger seemed nicer and cleaner to me. Bergen, on the other hand, is a very major port, and it's easier to get things. Um, 
So again, overall, Bergen would be cheaper, but I might be having to live actually in the city proper rather than in a suburbish of the city. So the price part is probably going to be a draw. I don't know. I still need to figure that part out, and that one I'm going to have to do closer to the time that I move. So yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Um, the vacation was... well. Ignoring quarantine, the vacation was great. Like, if I delete the quarantine part from my memory, everything was generally good. I had some anxiety attacks, partially due to how much quarantine wore on me emotionally, and partially due to the stupid pandemic being really weird. Um, trying to get out and back into the... Pardon me. Back into the U.S. was an interesting challenge that had me biting my nails a couple of times because nobody has any freaking documentation on this. So I had to guess a few times. That was always fun. But the vacation itself was nice. It was nice to actually be with my partner again. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to ask me wherever you see this, whether it's the link on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. <sighs> it's... Also nice to be back home. Although, oh boy, did I have a lot of cat vomit to clean up. My cats were not happy with how long I was away. That's for damn sure. And unfortunately, the house cleaners decided to put my weighted blanket on the bed instead of the green, green blanket like I had set out. The green blanket is there. One, it's a very large blanket. Two, it's a very thick blanket. And three, if the cats throw up on it, I can just immediately throw it in the washing machine and dryer and it's fine. Um, if my weighted blanket... I can't throw it in the dryer, and I'm supposed to limit the number of times I put it in the washing machine even. So that sucked. Um, this is a different weighted blanket for reference. I have three now. I had four. I brought one with me to Norway specifically, so we had one while traveling, and also, um, well, I'm going to be moving there. It's probably better to start moving a couple of things now. And creator can always use a second weighted blanket in case of the first one needs washing or anything like that. So yeah, that's my catch-up. It's been 32 minutes and 23 seconds. So I guess it's time for me to record that second video. I'll talk to you later, Internet. Bye.